This meeting is being recorded. There we go. Welcome everyone to our very first Hamilton Families Mental Health Awareness Month discussion. As many of you know, May is National Mental Health Awareness Month, a national movement to spread the word about the importance of mental health to fight stigma and to support, educate, and advocate for policies that support people and families who struggle with mental illness. This year, Hamilton Families is joining the movement by highlighting the importance of mental health as it relates to families experiencing homelessness and the frontline direct service staff members who are daily working on the ground floor, acting as a safety net for families. My name is Jeff Briz, Director of Communications, and I'm so excited to moderate this important discussion with our very own Diana Kenlo and Aaron Sumi. Diana is Hamilton Family's Family Services Intervention Manager. Our Family Services Intervention Program is an important support mechanism in our agency that provides coaching and training to participant-facing staff teams to ensure all of our service interactions are led by trauma-informed care principles and practices. Diana helps train Hamilton Family staff in strengths-based case management and has extensive social work experience working with families and youth throughout the San Francisco Bay Area. Welcome, Diana. Thank you. Erin Sumi is a licensed marriage and family therapist based out of Oakland, California, and has been providing his clinical expertise to Hamilton families as our staff, counseling, and wellness consulting clinician since the program's inception in 2019. Erin's treatment style focuses on offering a supportive, non judgmental approach while identifying and building upon strengths. He enjoys working with cultural issues around identity development and acculturation. Aaron has experience supporting clients with a range of issues from trauma slash PTSD to life transitions and specializes in racial identity and relationships. Diana and Aaron, welcome to you both. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yes. So I, I was thinking about, um, you know, diving into a few different topics. First, uh, so three things. First and foremost, Let's define what we're talking about when we when we talk about mental health. Part two, mental health as it relates to our work in family homelessness. And then part three, why it's so important for folks who work in this type of field, direct service, nonprofit work, to, to care for their own mental health, right? Um, so let's dive into part one. Um, first question is, what is mental health? You know, I can I can I can start us off. Yeah. Um, what is mental health? I think as we we talk about what is uh, mental health, I think what can be helpful is distinguishing um, mental health and mental illness. That oftentimes um, in our everyday you know uh, language we use them interchangeably. Um, and so when we talk about mental health, I like to think of it um, as that we all have mental health and mental health occurs on a spectrum. Um, similar to physical health, right, that we all have physical health. So the idea of um, uh, uh, taking, you know, actions and activities to keep up our mental health that contributes to our well-being, again, similar to, to physical health, is really important um, on an everyday basis. You know, we have here, as it relates to physical health, that can be exercise and eating, right? And mental health can be engaging in healthy relationships, setting boundaries, um, uh, you know, having time uh, by ourselves at times, like those are parts of upkeeping our mental health. And so we all have mental health um, and it can range on a spectrum. And then um, I think about the term mental illness, um, which can sometimes get interchanged, um, but mental illness is more about um, a diagnosable um, uh, challenge or condition that has a set of specific symptoms um, and that mental illness is something that um, can really impact our ability to function, our ability to carry out like daily responsibilities. Um, so that can be, you know, going to work, keeping up relationships for, um, for children that can be going to school, um, as examples. And so there's mental health that we all um, in society have. And then mental illness is something that is a diagnosable condition that really impacts our ability to, um, uh, to stay up on our responsibilities and functioning. Yeah, I love that. I love that distinction between yeah, what you just mentioned with mental, defining mental health 
and defining mental illness and where those two intersect and making sure that we're we're defining those two distinctly. Yeah, love that. Yeah. Yeah. And Aaron, and I agree. Um, that is um that's a great distinction distinction. Um and then as you were talking though, I was thinking about um you know, what you said is it is a diagnosed, right? Mental illness is diagnosable. And there's so many folks and certainly the families um, that we serve where there is, there hasn't been a diagnosis of what a family or family member is experiencing, right? And so sometimes it is, it's not properly diagnosed because it's not maybe considered as mental illness. And so the thinking is it's, oh, that's just how they act, or, you know, don't push the buttons because they're going to go off, um, or, you know, the self-medication, self-soothing, where overuse of alcohol or drugs comes into play, um, and so it just perpetuates, and it goes on, and it just becomes the personality of that family member. Oh, you know, auntie's like that, you know, you know, your uncle is like that, you know how far to push mom or dad, you know, so that they they don't go off. Um, so that piece is really important. And I and I think that those are the conversations and that distinction that we need to bring in-house and talk more about within the, the programs and then push that out to the families that we serve and into the communities. So we're really talking about that distinction. It's not just a personality trait. Maybe something's going on. Yeah. Can can you dive deeper into that, like the um, the piece around the different factors that may or may not influence one's mental health or may influence mental illness, but personal factors, external factors, there's a wide spectrum there. Did you want to get, go, Diana, or you want me to jump in there? Yeah, go ahead and jump in, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there, you know, we are, um, we are all impacted by um, external factors in our environment, you know, such as being unhoused or homeless, right? We're impacted by our relationships, which I would put under external factors. And then there are also internal factors, right, within us, um, how we set boundaries, our um, uh, uh, levels of positivity, you know, as it relates to mental health or mental illness, there are also genetics involved um, for some that impact their mental health. There can be um, uh, physical or medical issues that can impact one's mental health also. And certainly, again, the, the external factors um, play a role, right? When we are struggling for, for resources, when we're worried about where we're going to stay tonight, um, where, are, you know, are our children going to be safe um, if they don't have a place to stay tonight? obviously a normal reaction, right? No matter where you are on the mental health spectrum, that's going to cause a lot of stress and pressure, right? That can cause us to be sad associated with, with things like depression. So um, those factors, you know, the internal and external certainly affect um, our mental health and well-being. Yeah, that's love that. And I, I, the follow-up question to that is, and we'll go, this kind of take us to the part two piece, of does does mental do mental health challenges cause homelessness or does homelessness cause mental health challenges and mental illness or possibly accommodation but curious yeah you know, i think to to your point jeff it's it's a combination it's both right that um you know uh when folks are struggling with mental illness and mental health that can affect as we've been talking about one's ability to maintain relationships whether those be familial whether those be at work right um those can impact um uh i mentioned impact our functioning and our ability to kind of stay up on our responsibilities um you know on um especially with mental illness so you know being able to um, uh, work consistently, um, uh, you know, obviously that affects the kind of resources we can bring in. Um, and then on the other side of things, um, you know, the, the, the external environment of being unhoused, being homeless, you know, as I mentioned earlier, puts a, a, a tremendous amount of, uh, different emotions and strains on us. 
um, those worries around where am I going to stay tonight? Um, you know, do I have an address and cell phone to make it to this interview? You know, do I have, how am I going to access, you know, safe, um, effective health care? Um, all of those things um, can impact, right, um, um, our mental health and mental illness for sure. Yeah, and so, yeah, go ahead, Dana. No, I was, um, I think that that also when we, we think of mental health and family homelessness, um, it's, and oftentimes it's, you know, it gets a little complicated and it's definitely uh, multiple reasons. Um, you know, mental health uh, or mental illness um, oftentimes will lead to cognitive and behavioral problems that make it difficult to, Aaron's point, to earn a stable income um, or to carry out just daily activities that are related to and important to housing stability. Um, and, and, and even thoughts of all the things that it takes to run a, a household, right? Parenting, bills, neighbors, you know, work, all of those, you know, different factors can be overwhelming for an individual whose mental health is, you know, maybe sort of, you know, a little fragile. And then, you know, one more, one more thing, or, you know, one, something comes out of left field that um, an individual wasn't expecting could just tip it over. Um, and then they could, the mental health could decompose uh, very quickly. And even, you know, and the work that we do, when there is, when the mental health is not really stable, and then, and a family is experiencing um, homelessness on whatever level, whether unhoused or overcrowding, maybe in their car or shelter or transitional, and they're trying to, and they're, and to Aaron's point, right, they're worried about the children and the school and trying to find employment. How do I get my myself and my family out of this situation? And they're introduced to a program like Hamilton Families. Well, a lot comes with that. A lot comes with that introduction and that referral. Their meetings, their documents, their paperwork, their questions, like all of these things that are essentially, potentially contributing to the already, you know, um, experience of overwhelm, which during the process of trying to find safe, secure housing could tip an individual over, you know, and, and, and again, decompose their sense or their level of mental health. And so I think that that's where we have to be really careful when we're meeting with, when we're meeting with families and working with families, um, because again, you know, a fragile or a strained mental sta status um, can just quickly decompose due to, due to the stress and the over overwhelm of trying to to secure housing, and um, and what that can look like in practical practical terms um, may seem as if a family is not invested or a family doesn't want to get housing or a family isn't prioritizing when in fact the family or the individual is working incredibly hard to keep everything together so that they can do the things and uh, that they need to do to secure housing. And Jeff, I would just say, you know, the, uh, an important piece here to, to your original question of this relationship around mental health and homelessness um, uh, is that you know, I was looking at a study earlier and in one study specific to San Francisco, um, almost 60% um, of uh, unhoused homeless uh, families reported um, having serious uh, mental health issues. Um, so things that really impact one's ability to follow through on daily responsibilities and things um, when we talk about serious mental health. Um, and then that uh, over 60% of people um, struggle with uh, drug and alcohol use. Um, and so 
what we know, you know, is that there's a high incidence where people, you know, where families, where unhoused and homeless um, are, are facing these challenges and navigating them. I mean, a great piece, as Diana was mentioning, when you come into to Hamilton um, services is that's something that staff are um, very aware of, um, receiving information, education about resources, about what are mental health, mental illness symptoms, you know, how do we go about um, providing information, education when necessary, and just talks with the participants in within uh, Hamilton about this and and ways collaborating and coordinating together of ways that people can get the support that they need, you know, specific to mental health, mental illness. Yeah, that's that's so interesting, those statistics. Um, and it's just reminding me of as it relates to mental health uh, and family homelessness, this situation, I was, I was chatting with our workforce development coordinator. Um, so to give the audience context, um, we have a program called um, Rapid Rehousing. Essentially, if a family becomes unhoused, uh, our program prioritizes getting them into housing first and foremost uh, on the private rental market with a, a temporary rental subsidy that typically rests anywhere between 12 and 24 months. Uh, but the goal is by the end of that subsidy, the family is stable enough in terms of income, finances, mental health, uh, whatever it might be, childcare, to be stable on their own. Um, and that's ultimately the goal. And I was chatting with um, our coordinator and she was explaining to me a story of working with a, a family, um, came homeless in San Francisco. We were able to get them into a unit in the East Bay. Um, just as a single mom just had a newborn and was really struggling with postpartum depression. And at the same time, trying so hard to, to help this family, the mom get into a employment with a livable wage um, so that they can be stable. But it was just getting up in the morning and going about the day was already a struggle in and of itself. And so it's like, how do we how do we support the family in all facets that the family needs to be supported with? Um, so when you mentioned that, that just like that came to mind for sure. Um, and Diana, because you have so much experience, one, both you work directly with families um, in direct service work and you work directly with staff. I'm curious, like what experiences have you seen working with families as it relates to it, like when you're talking like this theme of like safety and stability are key external factors to supporting a family in terms of their mental health uh, do you have any stories you have any experiences working directly with families that you can share um, that kind of highlight that yeah I do and um you know and again it goes back to uh to Aaron's, you know, talking about um, being diagnosed. And so oftentimes in intake, well, one of the questions in intake that we have, when we talk about mental health and we'll ask a family or an individual um, within the family, um, have they ever been diagnosed with uh, a mental illness? Have, have they ever received a mental illness uh, diagnosis? And, um, you know, sometimes a family will put yes. and um, but then in asking, then the opportunity to review the application and ask more about that diagnosis, I find that oftentimes families don't understand it or individuals don't understand that diagnosis in and of itself. So yes, I was diagnosed this. Yeah, they gave me some medicine. I took it or I didn't. Um, but do you understand what it is? So to your question, Jeff, I think what's most important and what I find is um, creates a more successful outcome is ensuring that when family is experiencing any crisis, you know, whether it's a trauma memory or, you know, a traumatic, you know, crisis or, or episode, um, and we know that there has been a mental illness diagnosis, is to ensure that they understand what that diagnosis is and what it looks like when there is an experience. Right. So when there's an episode, what might that look like, whether it's depression, bipolar, whatever that is, because when an individual understands their behavior and maybe understands the triggers um, that are a cause for for episode, the more individuals understand 
um, what's going on with them and what this diagnosis means and how to manage it, the, it's more probable that they'll be able to stabilize themselves. And if there is an episode, you know, um, de-escalate maybe themselves or, you know, use the tools that they have. And so I, I, when I'm working with the families and if I'm called in for a crisis uh, intervention, um, a crisis response, that those are my questions. You know, I'm really trying to understand if this, there was a trigger to something and something that we can talk about and ensure that the individual really understands within themselves what's going on. Yes, love that. Um, any other thoughts or reflections um, as it relates to mental health specifically with family homelessness? Before we dive into the direct service work. Yeah, I think, um, you know, my thinking again, it, it really is just, it's knowledge and, and understanding. Um, when I'm working with staff, any training or focused discussion that I have with, with staff, I'm encouraging, bring that to the families mm -hmm. because we are a term program. You know, we're not permanent housing. And so the more information that we can provide to families, resources, referrals, right? Rooting in their community, but also understanding themselves and their behaviors. Um, any triggers. So the, the more information that we can impart on the families while they're with it, while they're in our program, I think that it, re it sets families up for, you know, when we think about stability, stability is housing, yes, but stability is, is also just a holistic experience. Right. And so the trainings, the conversations in and around mental health, the trainings, the conversations in and around behaviors, um, those are those are always encouraged um, to bring back to the family so the families understand themselves as well. Yes. Yeah, and a lot of a lot of tools around supporting someone with mental health are important tools for all of us, right? Whether that is um, identifying, you know. What are healthy relationships, right? Um, being able to advocate and communicate for oneself, being able to set boundaries and know what our limits are, you know, what we're able to do, what we're not able to do. These are all things that that um, support our mental health. And at the same time, there are things that are really important, right, to um, living, you know, to our well-being, whether that be you know, in relationship with others, whether that be at work, whether that's our parenting, all of those things are are really important, no matter where you fall kind of on the spectrum around mental health. And so um, they're tools that are um, really important. Yeah, love that. And like when you mentioned, so diving into the next subject of like mental health is something that all of us need to be thinking about and prioritizing. Um, let's dive into mental health as it relates to working in this field directly with high need populations, uh, folks who might be experiencing crisis, whatever that might be. Why is it so important for direct service staff to focus on their own mental health? I mean, one of the cornerstones of um, uh, one of the best practices um, within social services and especially folks who work with, you know, the unhoused is, you know, having empathy and really understanding what um, participants are experiencing and what they're going through. And um, if we take that, that, that piece of empathy and really understanding, you know, it also means that by, you um, by me as a staff person, really understanding what's occurring um, for this participant, I'm experiencing some of those, those emotions, right? I'm experiencing some of those traumas that, that um, sometimes our staff hear about, right? While they're building relationships with participants. And so through that, we have something called vicarious trauma that we have to be really aware of. And vicarious trauma is something that just by hearing the stories or the recalling 
um, uh, from our participants, we can experience, even if we weren't there, we can re-experience some of that trauma. And so, um, uh, and, and just at a, at a human level, um, seeing what people go through, seeing children and wanting to make sure they're getting the best right? Care and support and getting in school. Those things are important and staff are so heavily invested um, uh, in the well-being and lives of participants. Those things, um, that empathy highway, so to speak, those things um, we have to watch can really um, impact us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, Diana, if you have thoughts? Yeah, I did. And, and, you know, one of, I think, one of the greater tools um, in that it's really focusing on professional boundaries. Um, Aaron provides a professional boundaries um, training probably, you know, two or three times throughout um, the fiscal year at the organization. Um, and it's just, and, and there's a very, very um, thorough training when we have onboarding that, in, that Aaron provides to new staff coming on board as it pertains to professional or to yeah, professional boundaries. Um, and then there's a tool that we use um, here at Hamilton. It's the Professional Quality of Life uh, Survey. And it's a, it's a 30 question uh, survey that is anonymous. And it focuses on the health and well being of you know, folks who work in the service industry. And so we conduct it uh, annually for our participant engaging staff. Um, and it focuses on three subcategories, compassion satisfaction, compassion fatigue, and burnout. And the, well, so compassion satisfaction, um, that really focuses on um, just, you know, continuing to, to feel a sense of reward um, and fulfillment in the work that we do. So that's the satisfaction. And then the fatigue is what Aaron is talking about. That's the, the overwhelming, emotional, um, physical um, suffering that staff can experience through the vicarious trauma, right? Through getting hit with that. And then the burnout, um, and the burnout is really more um, operational work-related um, systems that are or are not in place that just creates um, a feeling where staff, you know, just may not feel as if the work that they're doing is really making an impact. They're just really overwhelmed. And so we conduct that annually and it gives the team and the organization a gauge, kind of a temperature on how staff are doing in those three subcategories. And it's really important because Aaron and I can then take that information, see where staff are, and then we can create the training curriculum for the following year. So in other words, if there was, you know, high percentage of staff who are really experiencing burnout. So that will be the focus on organization, professional boundaries, you know, um, how to manage time, manage work. Um, and then uh, on the team level, I can bring that to leadership and say, your staff are really struggling, you know, and sort of caught up in the middle of the workload or the administrative work. Similarly with um, compassion fatigue, here we can say, we can, you know, kind of look at it and determine, do staff have the right tools in place? Are they using the correct tools to protect them from the onslaught of the trauma and the crises, you know, just that are they able to separate work, um, work life and their personal life? You know, is there a clear boundary so that they can take care of themselves and really experience, um, you know, self-care on a level that where they're not being overwhelmed and, and really feeling bogged down with vicarious, uh, vicarious trauma. So I think that, um, you know, the, the work that we're doing with staff and encouraging peer support, um, when Aaron works with the teams um, in their counseling and wellness sessions, which are monthly, um, he holds a safe space for staff, but he also holds a piece where as staff are talking about their experiences, they can receive validation from their peers, acknowledgement from their peers, um, support from their peers, recommendations, you know, 
all of that, which is really important, the peer support and just creating an environment where I'm having a really tough day, but I can lean on my peer, I can lean on my coworker, that tool in and of itself, um, I think is incredibly important, especially in, in the work that we do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I was just going to add, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, John. No, go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to add, um, you know, to Diana's piece, this idea of um, uh, peers coming together and and providing support to each other, providing uh, consultation and coaching to each other around how to support participants is is a reflection that on um, Hamilton's unique services that, um, you know, each family um, has a very specific individualized um, case plan and way in which um, staff work with them based on their needs. And it differs from family to family, right? So it's highly individualized. And so, so the idea of, um, you know, this isn't a cookie cutter thing where we do the same thing for everyone. Right. And so being able to have consultation and talk to your peers, your supervisor, get feedback because it's so highly individualized is really important to understand, like, are there other actions I can be taking? You know, am I taking the, the right ones? Um, and that's really important because it's not, you know, this isn't like uh, finance or accounting where everything adds up. You know, if you do it right, it, it adds up to the same thing. This is really um, highly individualized work that um, uh, uh, is really dynamic. And so having those pieces, that feedback is really important to the work, yeah. the quality of the work, um, the mental, emotional um, support of, of staff. Yeah, that's huge. Um, can we dive into, um, the, you know, you're touching it already, but so Hamilton Families has... A, I would imagine a unique program called the Staff Counseling and Wellness Program. Um, as you can imagine, it's focused on staff directly. Um, but can you all dive into what exactly that program is, what's offered, and the, like the ins and outs of it? Yeah, totally. So um, the Counseling and Wellness Program, we are closing up our third year and preparing for our, our four, fourth year. Um, it's a program, um, it's a commitment actually that Hamilton families made about three years ago to support, to, um, you know, the support, the self-care and health and well-being of staff. And so um, we were talking about what might that look like. And we were thinking that creating um, or bringing in a service to staff where staff can learn the tools and frameworks that they need to do um, and understanding the dynamics and the emotional cost of the work, because that is a tool in and of itself, um, would support um, decreasing some of the burnout and the emotional stress. Um, and then in addition to that, ensuring that staff had an opportunity to work directly in one-on-one, -on -one, which that is a component of the counseling and wellness, as well as, as with their team. So there's an opportunity to just, you know, discuss just the emotional commitment and overwhelm, and also learning. Aaron does, uh, each month there is a topic that he trains on which is then a tool for the toolbox as the staff go out into the community. And so counseling and wellness, uh, we have one topic uh, each month and the topics range from, um, we have crisis de-escalation with participants and ourselves, um, transference and counter-transference, um, communicating program agreements and setting program expectations, boundaries, um, harm reduction, um, and, you know, as well as using self-care and there are some others. So each month there's a, there's a topic um, and um, all of the participant engaging teams, so residentials engage in a monthly session, as well as all of the rapid rehousing and, and the, the real estate teams. Erin, you want to add to that? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think that some of the thinking behind it is one, um, the, the more information that, that our staff have, they're feeling 
uh, more grounded, right? Um, they're obviously then um, using that to inform their work, you know, directly with um, our families. Um, having uh, uh, trainings on topics ranging from, you know, specific work with, with um, our families to also how do people take care of themselves, right? How do they do this work uh, for the long term, right? Um, because there are a lot of ups and downs inherent in the work that, you know, we do with families. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, 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 the well-being of our staff, you know, I think is directly connected also to um, their tenure, you know, um, how long they, they work at Hamilton. And that's really important when we're talking about working with, with um, homeless families, right, who oftentimes um, have, well, one, they're putting so much faith and um, really important parts, right, their housing, their well-being um, in coordination with staff that trust and that stability needs to be there. Um, uh, you know, the for many uh, families, they may have had where uh, letdowns or broken trust, fractures in relationships with friends or other family members. And so having someone stable consistently there in terms of tenure of our staff is really important too, right? They're putting so much trust into staff to guide them and support them in getting housing. Um, you know, that tenure um, and, and the support we can provide to staff is really, really important. Yeah, that's such an important piece, the, the relationship between the case manager and yeah. the family and making sure like it, it stays as consistent as possible uh, because it's the really relationship that helps move the family along from a place of housing insecurity to housing stability. Yes, absolutely. And one thing I will point out from the perspective of a staff member, one thing I really appreciate about the staff counseling wellness program is that anytime a crisis situation happens, whether that's within Hamilton families or in the world, immediately something is offered where, hey, if you need a space, um, if you want to do a one-on-one -on -one wellness session, um, sometimes we'll do a group discussion. Sometimes we'll do an entire organization or open it up to the entire organization to debrief on an incident. As an example, I remember last year when the, the mass shooting in Buffalo, New York, uh, targeting African-Americans in the grocery store, that triggered a lot of people in our organization. And I remember, um, Aaron, I think you opened it up. We had this really last uh, last minute um, debrief as an agency. Anyone can come and share how they're feeling, what's going on for them. And I remember how powerful that was for, for me personally. And then all of us being able to debrief together, like what we were experiencing was humongous in terms of getting, getting through that period. Um, so that's one thing I absolutely loved as a staff member that was unique from my experience. Um, and I will say that, you know, Aaron, Diana, and I, uh, worked closely with the, uh, with the reports for, for the grant, um, uh, that's included with it. And one thing I love is that, well, one here at Hamilton County's, one of our core values is being data informed. And this actually, like Diana, like you were mentioning with the pro poll that actually gives you like tangible data and numbers and statistics that you can benchmark off of in addition to the feedback, the testimony, the anecdotes uh, of exactly like how people are feeling and you see the numbers, you see what's being said and you're like, okay, now we can kind of work with that and plan ahead, uh, be more proactive in terms of supporting our staff, so on and so forth. Uh, so I think it, it's absolutely huge. Now, um, transitioning a bit. And Jeff, just I just wanna jump in there. Um, yeah, it, it really is. Um, it's very informative and similar to the ProQuel, we also um, provide an evaluation after the trainings. And so we're asking, we're ensuring that staff, you know, that the training material was clear and understanding, but we also ask staff how they can, how they can use this training in the work, in their day-to-day -day work. And that's, that piece is very, very important, right? And that's informing um, the organization and Aaron and I to that, the trainings that we provide, you know, we're not just picking trainings just to have a, a topic or a title, but but we're very intentional 
on thinking about trainings that support the staff, um, the work that they do um, in their day-to-day -day work. And we, the evaluations um, consistently show that the trainings that are coming and at the end of the, the, um, the fiscal year, um, Aaron and I come together and we kind of brainstorm. We look at the previous year and, and as we plan for the next fiscal year, but we also get input from the staff who um, are engaging in the counseling and wellness sessions um, and asking them what topics would you like to um, have training on in the next year. And so that is, we prioritize those trainings as we develop um, the next year's uh, agenda. So you're right. I mean, we are able to track and we're able to follow and ensure that what we're bringing to staff, it's comprehensive. It's not, um, you know, just sort of, uh, Aaron isn't just training, but it's a discussion. And as part of that discussion, um, you know, Aaron is very consistent in asking, you know, how could you, what would this look like in your work? Um, and, you know, as that discussion sort of deepens, how that topic can be used and experiences of peers and how they perhaps have used that particular training um, or that particular framework in their day-to-day -day work. Yeah, uh, the the uh, the needs of our families are pretty immediate. They need tangible, actionable help, you know, and support right now. And so, um, uh, you know, the training content is meant to also um, provide really, you know, to, to the staff, like what are tangible actions that we can use given this information, you know, that are immediate, tangible, that you can do in your work to help address those needs that participants have. And so it's, it's, uh, as Diana was mentioning, like, you know, the, 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 um, the, creating of the content or the curriculums for for the trainings and meetings is like we really focus it's not just about sort of the theory piece but like how can we leverage this information into tangible actions that result in tangible actions for for the families yeah and really focusing on the tools and the strategies and the knowledge to ensure that the families that we serve are receiving you know best practices that the families that we serve um, the needs that they that they need while they're working with us on whichever program, you know, from beginning all the way through, um, that their needs are being met and the resources that they need are available to them. Yeah, absolutely. And to add on, add on to all that, it, uh, to be clear, Hamilton Families is not perfect as it relates to this. Um, for sure, like we experience staff burnout. Um, all, all that stuff. And it, it's just hard work. Um, but one thing that I love is that what this program does is, like I mentioned, it provide, we are able to capture that feedback. And Aaron, like, I, I love how, like, you're very candid about your feedback as well to us uh, in terms of like, hey, hey this, these are the things that um, I'm noticing, these are the themes that I'm noticing with frontline staff. Um, and this is what I would recommend it get put in place to help mitigate or address some of those things. Um, and it's so helpful to have that, I guess, third party feedback mechanism as an organization so we can keep moving this thing forward. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I agree, huge. Jeff. And, you know, and, and again, you know, keeping in mind, this is staff driven, right? I mean, this is feedback from staff. This is staff saying, you know, and, and illustrating and demonstrating where they are with their work related health and well being. That's very, very important information for their team leads and for the organization. And then you're right, couple that with the recommendation that Aaron makes at the end of the report based on the time that he's had with uh, the participant facing staff. I mean, that's an amazing tool for programs, for pro program leads in the organization um, to ensure that the right mechanisms and tools are in place and available to staff to ward against this very, very hard work and it gets even harder, you know, at any time when we're experiencing, um, you know, episodes of being understaffed and just different stressors that, that, that come into play. And this is staff's opportunity to provide that voice, right? To say, I'm, I'm here, I'm committed, you know, I'm, I'm 100% I'm in to do the work, but I just, 
I need you to understand how hard it is. And so this report is, um, you know, a way that that can be demonstrated and illustrated to folks. Yeah, and so before we wrap up with our last two questions, I would be remiss not to give a quick shout out to the amazing Arlene and Michael Rosen Foundation, who um, have been incredible partners and helped make this staff counseling and wellness program happen for the past two years. Have been absolutely amazing partners of ours, for sure. Yeah, there it is. Um, Laura, Jason, if you're watching this, thank you so much. You all are amazing. Um, now, going into the last two questions, um, Diana and Aaron, imagine that I am getting ready to go into direct service work. I am finishing up my degree in psychology, social work, counseling, whatever it might be. And I'm ready to rock and roll and change the world, work with families, work with folks on the ground um, who are experiencing a lot of trauma. What would you recommend um, or any tips or advice you can give me in terms of making sure that I am taking care of my mental health and don't have to experience the intense burnout that a lot of folks who work in this field end up experiencing at some point. Well, you will experience it, so, <laughs> especially especially when you're new to the field, you are really going to experience it. So based on the scenario that you presented, um, my advice honestly would be to find yourself a seasoned mentor. Um, because when we come into this work for just the variety of reasons that we come into it, um, oftentimes we are just so open um, and susceptible to the traumas just on a higher level um, to the, you know, to the, to all that the families bring. So my, that would be my, my first recommendation. My second recommendation would be do your research and ensure that you understand the population that you're serving, because that again will help you with uh, drawing the boundary, boundaries, understanding the barriers. Um, when you're working with the families, you're not, you know, providing you know, resources or information that it just may not be relevant to their background and the experiences um, that they they've had prior to coming to the services, um, the agency that you'll be working with. Aaron, you uh, you hit my top two, Diana. <laughs> <laughs> I think. Uh, you know, uh, consultation and coaching from peers and from supervisor is really, really important and really a reflection on like the tremendous like wisdom and experience that Hamilton staff have. Um, and it's so unique, um, our work that uh, sometimes people that are not in it are not really sure how to how to support someone right and um because the work is so unique and dynamic and uh, the staff really do a great job of um providing support providing guidance on actions to take um in the work because they have such nuance and thorough knowledge of it um and it's it's just a it's a best practice in our work right to consult with peers and and with supervisors um uh, so it's it's a definitely a, a best practice um, across organizations, geographies, et cetera. Powerful. I love that. Um, and one thing that came to mind when you're when you're both mentioning that was um, for me, what came up was understanding your yourself, that that self-awareness piece as it relates to the work that you're going into. As an example, when I came to Hamilton Families two and a half years ago, um, and I was in grants, so you know, I wasn't working directly with families, but I didn't realize how influenced I was to, or how attracted I was to this work because of my own experiences with housing insecurity as a child. And that, that didn't come out until I was giving a pitch about Hamilton families and I started getting emotional about it. And I was like, wow, I need to, I need to explore this a little bit further and understand how this, this experience from the past really is showing up in my work now. So yeah, um, love all of that. All right, grand finale question. And we're gonna go a little bit macro. Um, Hamilton Families, our mission is to end family homelessness in the San Francisco Bay Area. In your opinion, 
what is one tangible thing folks can do to actually do that? I think um, what's very important to me, Jeff, is that we share our knowledge, our learning, we share the tools, we share the frameworks with the families. Because if families don't understand their circumstance, you know, Aaron talked about it when, you know, when we first started this conversation, mental illness, mental health, right? If families don't understand their circumstances, how they got here, generational, like all of those things, um, then they can't really move to a place of improving their circumstances that are sustainable. If I don't understand why I just keep, you know, I just go off or I'm triggered by this or I get really emotional. If I don't understand why I do that, then I won't be able to build in, you know, my internal mechanisms to keep things, you know, sort of, you know, measured and at a place where I can be successful in long-term employment. I can be successful in housing stability. I can be successful in my parenting. So for me, my answer is very clearly ensure that we are sharing the information that we learn and the tools and the frameworks that we learn on how to successfully work with the families that we're also sharing that with the families. And Jeff, give, give me your question once more so I can make sure I'm speaking directly to it. Yeah, um, at Hamilton Families, our mission is to end family homelessness in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, what is one tangible thing any ordinary person out there can do to actually make that happen? Hmm. Well, that's a dynamic and big question. You know, one of the things I think about that may be a little bit different is um, uh, engaging in um, uh, politics and policy in, in the Bay Area. Um, having a strong understanding of what families um, are experiencing, what their needs are, um, uh, understanding the, the, the data behind it and um, advocating, you know, in local policy, local government, um, you know, for uh, homeless families. You know, obviously in San Francisco, um, homelessness is a, is a very public and big issue on people's minds. And I remember uh, talking with someone um, who was concerned about homelessness in San Francisco. And I, I pointed out like, hey, there, you know, of the vast amount of people um, who are experiencing um, homelessness, you actually do not see. There are people who are coming through the doors of Hamilton who are getting services, who don't end up on your sidewalks and streets, you know, who are couch surfing and things like that, who are getting housing. And that's really important to understand, too, that there is some really great work going on. And, and where do we need to, you know, focus policy, funding, um, local government um, to help inform and, and collaborate with them on um, supporting kind of large scale change that um, Hamilton is working towards. Yes, absolutely love that. Family homelessness is ultimately a housing and policy issue. And I, I love that you tapped, tapped onto that. So Aaron and Diana, Thank you both so much for this amazing, insightful discussion and for our very first uh, Mental Health Awareness Month uh, chat. And I'm sure we will be doing more in future years as well. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. And for all of you tuning in, be sure to subscribe, smash that like button, and follow us on all of our social media channels. Um, with that, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff.